It's the world's driest inhabited continent, currently in the grip of the worst drought in a century, what the Australians call the Big Dry. Government scientists have warned that deadly bushfires will become more frequent and more intense, and that large swathes of the shoreline will be uninhabitable by the end of the century, threatening a coast-hugging way of life. Yet climate change scepticism is a powerful and growing force in Australia, both intellectually fashionable and increasingly politically viable. It's the height of the Sydney summer, and these are the kind of lines you'd normally see outside a cricket match. 800 people are packed into this ballroom, 250 have been turned away, and they've gathered for what feels like a revival meeting. They've come to hear the high priest of climate change scepticism, Lord Christopher Monckton. Ladies and gentlemen, good day, Australia. With aristocratic panache, the British Viscount delivers an Al Gore style PowerPoint presentation in which he pillories Al Gore. And then, of course, the arch liar of them all, St. Albert Arnold Gore Blimey. And he says, he says, I believe it is appropriate uh, to have an over representation of factual presentations on how dangerous it is. More recently, he's had a new target in his sights, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the UN body which advises world leaders. He claims its estimates of how much the planet will heat up are hugely and falsely inflated. The UN is exaggerating the effect of CO2 on temperature seven and a half times over. Take that exaggeration away and you take away the problem. No more climate problem because it's entirely based on that central exaggeration. He ends his lecture with a stirring exhortation. So enough is enough. Listening to the British peer has been Australia's foremost climate change sceptic, Professor Ian Plymer. His best-selling book, Heaven and Earth, is a demolition job on the scientific case for anthropogenic global warming. And like Lord Moncton, he's viewed by many as an anti-hero. Opposing the green agenda, he claims, has not only become politically respectable, but politically advantageous. In Australia, the mood is changing very quickly. It was certainly political suicide a year ago to stand against that popular political decision. Now it isn't, and I would imagine in three or six months' time it again will be very different. The community is shifting their view very, very quickly, and I suspect that our leading politicians in the government haven't got the ear tuned to the public masses. This is what the Australians call a camp draft. An Antipodean take on the rodeo, where stockmen and drovers get the chance to show off their horse skills. It's taking place in central Queensland, which like other parts of rural Australia, is suffering the effects of the big dry, the once in a century drought. But the bush and outback are also a stronghold of climate change scepticism. Many farmers believe the parched conditions are merely cyclic rather than the result of global warming. Hey John, pleased to meet you John. Yeah, pleased to meet you. Where's home for you John? It's also the political turf of one of Australia's most outspoken climate change sceptics. Senator Barnaby Joyce of the rural-based National Party. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here in Rome this afternoon. Um, He's a man on a mission, a fierce opponent of the Rudd government's plans for an emissions trading scheme, the ETS. We've got some other work to do while we're here. We're going to try and uh, knock off the ETS. We're going to try and get some support around town to make sure that um, this new tax that they're going to try and bring in on, on us is stopped, so uh, this is a working trip, and so we'll be doing a fair bit over the next couple of days or the next week or so to try and uh, knock this thing on the head. Otherwise, I'm just going to be lumbering you people with a massive new tax 
And I don't know how you're going to pay it because people are doing it tough enough as it is. This nation will not allow you to hear the contrarian view. And this is the work he's referring to, a town meeting attended mainly by farmers, where he sets out his case that it would be ridiculous and ruinous for Australia to take unilateral action on global warming. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is not. There is nothing Australia can do by itself. Even if you're the most ardent global warming proponent, there is nothing Australia can do that is going to change the temperature of the globe. Nothing. So why are you paying this tax? Isn't this sort of a fraudulent, uh, a fraudulent sort of aspiring towards a guilt trip that puts you in a sense of guilt, so they, therefore you feel that you have to support a tax, because if you don't support a tax, you are a heretic, you are a sceptic, you are someone evil, you are, you, you know, you are less, lesser, lesser than human. And that's one of the other things that really worries me about this debate. Anybody who dares question it, anybody who dares question it is, you know, denier. Skeptic, heretic, where is the balance in this debate? If Australia's initial prosperity was built on its farming sector, its post-war rise has been powered by its abundance of resources. The country is sometimes referred to as the quarry of the world, and the Saudi Arabia of coal its largest export. Critics have also called it a greenhouse ghetto because it has the highest emissions per capita of any developed nation. But at a time when the Rudd government has been fighting to enact its emissions trading scheme, it's also been battling to stave off recession. And the resources sector has helped make it the only major economy to do so. It's strengthened the skeptic's argument that the government's green agenda would damage the very thing which keeps Australia prosperous. You want an emissions trading scheme that is going to set a carbon price in the market in such a way that it is economically efficient and environmentally effective. The scheme that is proposed in Australia at the moment will not do that. Essentially what it will do is impose a massive tax on industry, the revenue of which will be distributed to households, principally in Australia, to compensate them for the very changes in behaviour that you're trying to affect. Uh, and all of that with, without a significant reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Kevin Rudd came to power offering new leadership on climate change. He called the fight against global warming the greatest moral, economic and social challenge of our time. He promised to do what his predecessor John Howard had refused for years to countenance, ratify the Kyoto Protocol, a process he started on his very first day in office. But after the symbolism of signing up to Kyoto, the Australian environmental movement has been highly critical of Mr Rudd's green agenda. They claim the ETS doesn't do enough to curb the big polluters and that the unconditional pledge to cut emissions by 5% is pitifully small by international standards. The Greens admit it's created a political opening for the sceptics. The lack of a clear direction forward from a consensus within the environment movement has clearly created an opportunity for the climate deniers to say to the Australian people, look, the other side doesn't know what they're doing, we've got the answers for you. And the answer, which is pure snake oil, is, look, there isn't a problem and we don't need to worry about it. They have exploited the opportunities created by disagreement on the, on the environment side. The Australian capital, Canberra, boasts the greenest parliament in the world. It has grass growing on its roof. But its upper house, the Senate, where the government does not command a majority, is nowhere near as environmentally friendly. It's already twice rejected the Rudd government's emissions trading scheme, its environmental centrepiece, the last time on the very eve of Copenhagen. The Senate's obstructionism has already handed the government the trigger to call a snap election, a climate change election. But would it be wise to pull it? The politics of global warming have changed since the last time the Rudd government tried to enact its emissions trading scheme. There's the failure at Copenhagen to produce a more comprehensive agreement. Massachusetts has made it much more difficult for the Obama administration to push its own green agenda. 
And then there's climate gate, the accusations that scientists have been massaging the data. Once considered a major selling point, have Kevin Rudd's environmental policies suddenly become a liability? The talk in Canberra is how the polls have suddenly shifted. Prior to Copenhagen, support for the ETS was steady at over 60%, but recently it's dived by 10%. The proportion of Australians who fear there's a risk of catastrophic climate change has also slipped to below 50%. Then there are those who are asking why Australia should press ahead with an ETS, a major structural reform of its economy, when the rest of the world hasn't yet signed up to binding cuts in emissions. It's the first morning of the new parliamentary year. 